Extrusion width determines how wide the line of a material is that your 3D printer extrudes through its nozzle. And that's a parameter I rarely touched until now. For today's video, I've investigated the influence of the setting on print quality and layer adhesion. And oh boy, if you want to have a strong print fast, then this might be interesting for you. Guten Tag everybody, I'm Stefan and welcome to CNC Kitchen. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that I recently started using to easily provide write-ups and the results of my research. Create your own website by browsing squarespace.com slash CNC Kitchen. More on Squarespace at the end of this video. Most of us probably change the layer height we print with quite a bit and adjust it depending on if we want to print something fast or nice. A parameter that I don't see many adjust is the extrusion width that the slicer uses. And at this point I'd be really interested if you ever touched it and why. Let me know in the comments. The extrusion width is how wide the line of material that is printed is. Please don't mix that up with the extrusion multiplier. The extrusion multiplier only adjusts the flow of the material, but keeps the distance between the tracks the same. Extrusion width sets the distance between the lines and adjusts material flow accordingly. Most of us probably use a 0.4mm nozzle on our machines, and the width of the filament line doesn't necessarily need to be exactly that value. Going smaller might seem a bit counterintuitive, but is actually possible and can even be beneficial for quality. Most slicers use a standard value of 100 to 120% of the nozzle diameter. This means the material extrusion is as wide as the nozzle's orifice or just a bit wider. Since the nozzle tips have a bit of a flat area around the hole, the layer height will be kept and the material will not be squished upwards. Also, if I later talk about extrusion width, I will usually use the percentage value, which means what percentage of my 0.4mm nozzle diameter. Some slices like Cura hide extrusion width by default and let you define the wall thickness, which doesn't necessarily need to be a multiple of the extrusion width. For full control over that value, I use Prusa Slicer 2.1 for all prints. With higher extrusion width, the pressure inside of the nozzle needs to be higher as well to squeeze the material to the sides after it leaves the nozzle. This additional pressure does not only squeeze the material to the side, it will also press the individual layers together more, which poses the question if that also helps with the layers bond together better. This is exactly the task for today's video. In order to investigate the question, I printed 3D benches for quality assessment and layer adhesion samples as well as my test hooks for strength testing. I thought it would be interesting to even start from extrusion with smaller than the nozzle bore up to really high values. I printed all parts with a 0.4mm nozzle and started at 90% extrusion width and went all the way up to 250%. That's 0.36mm to 1mm and the latter is the diameter of the nozzle tip of a standard E3D nozzle. Pay attention if you use different nozzles, for example the MK8s of the CR10 and all its variants and clones, because their nozzle tip looks different, which has advantages and disadvantages. The parts were printed on my original Prusa i3 Mark IIs in Spoolworks PLA at nozzle temperatures of 210 degrees Celsius, 50% fan and 0.16mm thick layers. In order to have ambient temperatures as constant as possible, I had the printer in my basement where I have quite consistent temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius. Each print job for one extrusion width consisted out of one 3D Banshee and a pair of three layer adhesion specimens. The 3D Banshee and the test samples were printed sequentially so that the layer times were consistent and didn't jump. At first, let's take a look at the print quality. It was very interesting to see how all 3D Banshees look basically the same up to 140% extrusion width. Even the model with 90% width didn't look differently. At 160%, I was slowly able to spot artifacts in the overhanging regions, probably because the material is squeezed out that much. 
At 250%, the whole surface was even strangely textured. At 200% and higher, the flagpole base just vanished, not because of printing problems, but because the part just had too thin walls to be printed with a 0.8mm extruded line. At higher extrusion widths, some areas looked as if they were a bit under extruded, though I think it was only the overlapping areas with the perimeter that needed tuning. All in all, the printable range is way bigger than I initially thought and 150% width still seems reasonable. You have to keep in mind that especially thin areas might suffer faster in quality, because the additional extrusion pressure will create a downward force on the part, squishing it together. Also, the additional material will add drag between the nozzle and the part and therefore might deform it due to the shear forces or cause other issues. Another thing that you have to keep in mind is that with thicker extrusions you also pump out more material in the same amount of time that needs sufficient cooling. In the worst case you might even get to the limits of your hot end where it's not able anymore to melt the material properly causing even more issues. In such a case it might be a good idea to take a look at hot ends like E3D's Volcano or just bump the temperatures a little bit up. Now let's continue with the layer adhesion tests. The samples that I printed were measured and then mounted in my DIY universal test machine where they all were loaded at a constant speed until failure. This should give us very comparable values because it removes the human factor. Here again the samples up to 140% extrusion width looked very similar and only at wider extrusions some problems seemed to occur. For statistics I tested 3 samples for each setting and I didn't test them in order to avoid any systematic error. The results are very interesting because we can clearly see that the layer adhesion slowly rises from 90% to the maximum probably at 150%. After that it falls again but the reason for that behavior might also be that the samples got really rough and the stress rises on the surface caused premature failure. Just for reference, the pure material strength is at around 60 megapascals, so even though the layers seem to adhere better, we're still a bit away from perfect fusion of the layers, but again, a bit closer. As I already mentioned in the last video, this is actually a video series where I analyze the influence of strength of different printing parameters and then ultimately want to combine them to get the maximum strength of our 3D printed parts. Design of experiments, if you know what I mean. If you don't want to miss that, make sure that you're subscribed and have also selected the notification bell. At lower extrusion widths, the crack planes are only over one or two layers and they become more ununiformly the more material is squished out. Another indication that we're on the right track. Next, in order to apply that to a real problem, I also printed a couple of my test hooks to see if our findings on the simple layer adhesion samples also hold true here. All in all, I printed 12 parts, all standing. 3 had 2 perimeters and 100% extrusion width. 3 had the same number of perimeters but at 200% width, doubling the wall thickness. 3 were printed with 4 perimeters and 100% width, resulting in the same wall thickness. 3 were right in between, with 3 perimeters and 133% extrusion width. Of course, the pots with thicker walls will be stronger, but is it better to use more perimeters or thicker extrusions. I did a whole video on why you should make your parts stronger by adjusting parameters instead of infill ratio. Card up here. Besides strength, I also noted down printing time and weight. I, for my part, work in aerospace and am impatient. That means that for once I want the most strength per weight and the strongest print time in the shortest amount of time. Some might argue that print time doesn't play a role for them, so by just using more perimeters and infill they make their parts stronger. But still, if you're someone like this, then having even stronger parts with wider extrusions might be a bonus on top. The quality of the hooks wasn't as different as with the 3D Banshees and the layer adhesion coupons. 
even the 200% samples still looked okay. Since I only used 20% infill, there always was a bit of space left to push the surplus material out. So, as suspected, the hooks with only two parameters failed at first at around 20 kg of load. Next were the hooks with four parameters and 100% extrusion width at 33 kg, but with quite some scatter. Second came the parts with three parameters and 130% extrusion width at 37 kg of failure load, and the strongest ones were actually the ones with only two parameters and double the normal extrusion width at 39 kilograms on average. This is almost double the strength with the same printing time when we compare it to the first sample. The printing time was even lower because the infill is thicker, so less lines need to be extruded. So if you are impatient as I am, then thicker extrusions will give you stronger parts in the same amount of time. If you are looking for parts that use the given material as efficiently as possible, thicker extrusions will help you in this regard as well, because layer bonding will be better. Pretty cool. <laughs> so what's the wording? We have once again learned that the strength of our 3D prints is not only a result of the materials we use, but also the settings. Using wider extrusions seem to help layer adhesion, because the material is squished more onto the previous layer. At some point you run into quality problems, but to be honest, that's usually not your biggest concern with mechanical parts. If you need a strong part quick, then upping the extrusion width is almost directly proportional to the gain in strength, which is really cool. You might have the same advantage with a bigger nozzle, but this method saves you the hassle to switch all of the time. Just keep in mind that you will extrude more amount of material in the same time frame, so make sure your hot end and cooling setup is able to handle that. The detailed test results are available for my Patreon supporters, but if you only want to take a second look at the graphs, then make sure to check out my new website, where I'll be posting write-ups of all of my videos. This is thanks to today's video sponsor Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautifully looking online presence. Not only do they have a ton of professional templates for you to start with and free stock photos for customization, their online editor is so intuitive to use and helps me to create and maintain my website with no hassle at all. If you also have a business or just want to share your latest hacks and prints or even create a shop in a professional manner, then start your free Squarespace trial today at squarespace.com slash cnckitchen and use code cnckitchen to get 10% off your first purchase. If you're ever stuck and need assistance, they have a great help center and 24-7 customer support. Try out Squarespace two weeks for free by browsing squarespace.com slash cnckitchen and let them know who sent you by using code cnckitchen for 10% off upon checkout. Thank you Squarespace for supporting this channel. Thank you for watching. I hope you have learned something new today. If you did, then please leave a like and make sure that you're subscribed for future investigations. If you want to support my videos and research, then consider becoming a patron or help me out in other ways. Also check the rest of my video library because I'm just about to reach 100 videos and there's a ton more for you to watch and enjoy. I hope to see you in the next one. Auf Wiedersehen and goodbye.